So we'll get started. So today we go. Uh, I uh, requested for you to bring your list of the orders uh, because today we're going to help you to uh, kind of start looking at some of them and or give you some of the pointers, some of the clues that you might need to uh, know so that you can uh, start uh, IDing some of the insects. Uh, so that's going to be the goal today. Today we're going to concentrate on the biggest insect groups or the insect orders. And one of the biggest ones uh, that is going to be out there is going to be the beetles. Uh, and so that's uh, the first uh, screen that we have. Uh, uh, we have a photograph of a ladybug or lady beetle, as many people call them, ladybugs. Uh, and uh, when you look at the name, uh, uh, Coleoptera for the order, uh, when you see the word Aptera uh, or the ending, that means wings. So the wings is what they use to kind of classify or put them into this order. Uh, and so for the beetles, uh, they're going to have, or the, the insects are going to have, uh, can have two wings, four wings. Uh, presence or absence of the wings is going to be important. Uh, the veins of the wings are also going to be important depending on the different insect groups. And so for the beetles, they have four wings. Uh, and all beetles have the first two wings or the first uh, pair of wings modified into a sheath. A sheath, uh, a shield, a plate uh, that is going to protect them, and they'll use that as a protection. And so I mentioned before that uh, some of the larger beetles are nothing more than a walking, a walking tank, because that's what they have. They have a big armor. And so here is uh, the photograph. And so the yellow that you see here extending out, that is that sheath. Uh, it is referred to as elytra, E-L-Y-T-R-A, so elytra, uh, and uh, it's a modification of the wing, so it's hardened, uh, and uh, the other thing that you need to know with all the insects, uh, their exoskeleton is made out of chitin, uh, that is going to be the crunchy part when you step on them, that's their skin, and uh, humans do not really digest chitin, so when people kind of eat insects, uh, most of the insects actually just uh, goes away and not really be used uh, or digested by humans. Uh, so it's chitin, uh, the, their skeleton, their wings are hardened, rigid, no longer, or the first pair, pair no longer serving as a uh, flying apparatus. Uh, so the flight is going to be done by the second pair of wings that you see here extending out. So anytime the beetle is going to have to take flight, it's going to open the elytra uh, and then the wings will come out. But because of the weight of the elytra, it's not really balanced. Uh, the beetles, some of the beetles can be kind of clumsy flyers. Uh, and I mentioned before that uh, people always say, oh, they, they always land on my hair. Well, it's not the fault of the beetle. Uh, you were walking, you were near it. It just was a clumsy flyer. It landed in your hair. And it's not that they're trying to kill you or they're attacking you. Uh, there's going to be many, many different types of beetles. And they're going to live in every kind of niche, every kind of environment. Uh, there's going to be beneficial. There's going to be pests. There's going to be human problems with uh, beetles. There's going to be beetles that are going to be uh, pantry pests. They're going to eat your food. And so they have a, uh, a, a very long history with uh, people. When looking at insects, don't concentrate so much on the specific insect because you're going to come to a big dead end. There's so many of them that trying to pinpoint it to the specific genus and species of that insect is not, it's very difficult. Uh, so where, concentrate on the order, first of all, if you see something that looks like a beetle, let's get it to the order. Okay, so it's a coleoptera. And then if you wanna pursue it further, then you can take it to the family level. So for example, the family level scarabity includes all the scarabs. Uh, the family level Curculionidae includes all the weevils that we'll see in a few minutes. And uh, there's also going to be some bark beetles, and those will fall into a different family. 
So don't focus so much onto that specific insect. I want to know what this specific insect is. That would be later on. Uh, but focus on just getting it to the family level or the family group. So if you say this is a scarab beetle for the class, it's good enough. Uh, then if you want to do further research as to what are the scarabs that you find here in Southern California, then you might find the specific one. So don't focus like, oh, I must find it. I must find a specific, this specific beetle, what is it? So, and so with each of the families, there is gonna be some other characteristics that you can look at so that you can start placing them into uh, those families. So then uh, we know that beetles live in every environment. So even in water, so I was able to take this video of what is known as a predaceous diving beetle. This is underground. Uh, as they evolve and they change, uh, notice it almost looks like a torpedo. So it's now very slick uh, and because it needs to maneuver through the water. Uh, and uh, it's gonna pick up a bubble of air. So it's gonna come up to the surface. It's going to breathe. Uh, or pick up a bottle of oxygen, a, a bubble of oxygen, and then it's going to dive until the oxygen goes away, and uh, then it's going to have to come out to breathe again. Predaceous diving beetle because they will chase other insects. They will feed on tadpoles. They can feed on anything they can capture in in the water, and so this have evolved to take the niche or the advantage of the niche. Uh, of uh, the water. Now, when the arthropods that came to the land uh, and evolved in the land, uh, they cover every single part of the world. There was one area they couldn't go back to, and that was they couldn't back to, go back to the ocean uh, because the ocean, the seawater, was now being uh, dominated by the crustaceans, the shrimps, the lobsters, which are nothing more than water insects. Uh, so that's why the insects are usually confined to some freshwater habitat, uh, or they, they are some in the beach or around the beach area, but rarely do they venture uh, further into the ocean or into the uh, deep water. Uh, so if you go hiking, if you go anywhere, look in the streams uh, and uh, you may see them. The other thing that is important with insects, keeping in mind that 99% of the insects that you're going to find are going to be very, very small. Uh, so uh, they're going to always be careful. They're going to be cautious about uh, being discovered because there's going to be birds and uh, they don't want to be eaten. Uh, so most of the time when you get close to them, their first line of defense is to freeze. They're not going to move. Uh, and so it might be difficult for you to find them. Uh, but if you're quiet, and if you come up close to them, then uh, they're not going to move or they might not see you or they might not suspect that you're an enemy. Also, when you're trying to grab them, don't do sudden motions because that's a bird coming out that they know, they recognize it, they see you, they drop to the ground or they fly out. The best thing is to come up to them slowly and then you can grab them. The insects are going to be their metabolism is gonna be dictated by the temperature. So when it's nice and warm, uh, they're gonna be very active. So the best time to catch the insects are gonna be early in the morning when it's nice and cool. They're not still having gotten warm. They're not gonna be very fast. By 12 p.m. around here, it's so warm that it's gonna be very difficult for you to catch them. So, and uh, the temperature also determines their uh, development. So when it's very hot, some insects can go from egg to adult within a matter of days for flies and or a matter of weeks uh, for some other insects. Uh, so here's uh, uh, some of the lady beetles or the family for the lady beetles. Uh, there's gonna be the ladybugs, lady beetles that is gonna be beneficial, but many of the others are gonna be known as leaf beetles because they will eat uh, the leaf. Uh, this one is, coming around here now this is uh, the eucalyptus leaf beetle so if you see eucalyptus around the city uh, go uh, look for them uh, we got the nocturnal which is the one that i'm showing you right here 
So during the daytime, this one is asleep. So you might need to look for it uh, in between the bark or peel back some of the bark where they're hiding uh, to sleep. And then uh, now we also have a diurnal. So there's two insects that are eating the leaves of eucalyptus around here. And the diurnals are gonna be active during the daytime. And you can see them running around eating the leaves uh, of those trees. Uh, so leaf beetles, uh, we mentioned, I mentioned bark beetles, and these are gonna be very problematic. Uh, <coughs> this is uh, gonna be the eucalyptus borer, uh, which is a bark beetle. And so when we're looking at bark beetles, there's gonna be some important things that you need to jot, uh, jot down or write down. Uh, number one, is it a flat-headed uh, beetle? Uh, or is it a round headed? And I'll show you what I mean a little bit later on. Uh, that would be number one. Uh, and then the other word that you need to always keep in mind is going to be the word fras, F R A S, which is nothing more than insect uh, poop uh, or the waste product of the insect. Uh, so many insects are going to pack their fras because they don't want to send out any signals, any anything to the predators, letting them know that they're around. So they're gonna pack it in their tunnels. Uh, and many of them are gonna be kickers. They're gonna kick it out. Uh, depending on whether it's a packer or a kicker, those are important things because only certain specific uh, <clears throat> beetles will do that. And uh, also how high within the tree uh, are you finding them? <clears throat> because certain beetles only affect uh, areas close to the ground, a few of them are a couple of feet above, and a few of them may even go into the branches. <clears throat> this is a bark beetle. So those are important things to jot down if you're gonna be looking for bark beetles. So what happens? A tree is gonna have to be under stress. Uh, the tree is gonna be under stress. And then uh, you can see right here at this point, where the tunnels are very, very narrow, that is probably where the female bark beetle laid her eggs into the bark of the tree. Uh, right below, below the bark where there's a vascular system, the vascular cambium that is gonna be nice and soft. Uh, and it has to be under stress because that way the immune system, the sap is not flowing as well. So it's not going to gum the mouth or the jaws of the insect. So as the insects are, when the insects hatch, then they're gonna be small. So that's why the tunnels are very narrow and they're gonna start biting and eating the bark and they're gonna keep on moving. And you can see the progression as the tunnel gets uh, wider and wider, the insect is growing and growing and growing and going through the different life stages until eventually the tunnel becomes very wide. By that point in time, the insect, uh, the larva can now become an adult and go out, find a mate, and uh, start the cycle again. Question? This is eucalyptus bark beetle. Yes. This? No, that is the frass. That is where it has been packing. The, it's a frass. Well, no, this is this. If you see the tunnels, this is where a lot of them just kind of probably met each other and it's just, it became. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so this brings back the stress of the plant. Why it's important to keep uh, them healthy so that they can fend off uh, this uh, infection. The other thing that you need to know uh, that is very important is that insects communicate uh, through pheromones. Uh, nothing more than a, a type of perfume, chemical signals. And so when a male uh, beetle or several male, male beetles uh, find a tree that is under stress, uh, they can release a pheromone or even the females uh, letting other beetles know that there is a tree that is under stress 
then they congregate, they mate, and that's when they lay the eggs on the tree. So pheromone is how the insects communicate with one another. Uh, so this is what happens. So if you see some trees that are dead, if you peel back the bark, uh, you may see some of these tunnels. How do they affect the tree? By destroying or eating the vascular system. If they were to girdle entire branches, that entire branch will be dead. Uh, with the bark beetle that we're seeing right now, if they girdle the entire stem uh, or the main stem of the plant, then that entire tree is dead. And so population numbers, they can overwhelm a tree by just this continually destroying the vascular system and the tree will inevitably die. What do you mean by girdle? Girdle meaning that they will eat the, uh, the entire perimeter of uh, the stem. Uh, so as they eat, they destroy the vascular system, preventing the water from getting to the top. And so the entire tree will die. And there it is. That's the culprit. Uh, the other thing that you need to know, uh, okay. that's what it looks like. Uh, this is a flat headed borer. So you notice it has a flat head. Uh, the other thing that you need to know with uh, some of the immatures, uh, when uh, an immature, you find an immature for a beetle, uh, it's usually gonna be referred to as a grub. Uh, when you find an immature of a fly, it's going to be referred to as a maggot. When you find an immature of a cat uh, butterfly, then it's a caterpillar. Sometimes with beetles, you might find why, uh, what is known as a wire worm. That is also a beetle. Or uh, some of those, uh, uh, to, 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 the ones that they feed the uh, reptiles, uh, mealworms, those are also beetles. Uh, immature beetles. So those are other, other names uh, for just the larva of uh, some of those, some of the beetles. Uh, uh, some of the grubs uh, for the beetles can uh, arch or kind of, if you grab them or you find them, they are going to curl and kind of hide. Uh, and uh, they may eat some of the substrate. In this case, they feed on a living tree. Uh, and the face is right here. These are the jaws. So they're darker because they're sclerotinized, they're hard. They have to be able to chew through the tree. Uh, and so the rest is very soft. Question. This is the grub for the eucalyptus bark beetle and it's big. So it's a couple of inches. Uh, devastated many eucalyptus a couple of years ago. That's why you don't see a lot of eucalyptus anymore as it used to be, especially around uh, parks. Uh, so the grub for eucalyptus bark beetle, there is a close-up of uh, the face or the mandible or uh, the mouth. And there's a side view uh, showing you the tunnel. And this is just, uh, we found this by uh, pulling the bark, uh, then right behind the bark and they'll start kind of trying to run away. And there's for scale uh, for this little one. Uh, and uh, all the sawdust that you see underneath it, that's all the frass uh, that they have left behind. And uh, so here it is, as it's moving forward, this is the frass that has been packed. So they don't come back. It's just they go one direction and then uh, uh, pupate and then come out as an adult. So this is uh, the packing on the frass. So do the adults eat bark or is it just grub? It, depending. So with beetles, there's going to be certain adults that may feed on plants and leaves. In this case, it is only the juvenile or the grub stage that is uh, damaging to the trees or that it's a pest. Uh, and that's going to be more many insects that the damage can occur during the juvenile stage, which could be several weeks or several months. The adults uh, may have a lifespan of maybe one week uh, or maybe two weeks. And all they are worrying about is finding a mate and lay next, that's it, and then die. Huh? They may eat some leaves, they may eat some organic matter. Some of them may feed on pollen and nectar, uh, but the adults for this, they do not eat. They cannot go back into the, into the tree. Uh, so they can make it eat some leaves or other stuff. And there's a cases where some insects don't even have a mouthpiece or a mouth part. They, they're never meant to, to live more than a day or two. 
And in that, that short period of time, they have to find a mate and then they die. So there's the grub. Uh, and there's a close up of it, uh, kind of like a side view close up uh, of uh, it. Uh, and just different angles so you can see it. Uh, then there is a uh, gravity, uh, which is uh, ground beetles. Uh, so here's the elytra, as I mentioned, the first wing is uh, there's the armor, uh, it's complete. And so ground beetles, they can fly, they still have the wings, but many of them choose not to, so they kind of run around. Uh, they can resemble a rock or hide as a rock. Uh, sometimes when you find them, some of these big ones, uh, and you reach to grab them, they're going to lift their rear end, kind of telling you that if you touch me uh, or you could try to grab me, I'm going to sting you. Beetles do not sting. That is a bluff. Uh, so, but many people who do not know, obviously, they're going to leave him alone. Uh, and uh, the beetle is going to run, run away as soon as he can. Uh, so uh, that's going to be uh, kind of their life. They are going to be predators. Uh, they are going to be good guys, or many of them are going to be good guys. They can eat snails. They can eat slugs. They can eat other insects in the garden uh, or anything else they can catch. Sometimes if they find dead insects on the ground, they will, uh, they will eat them as well. They're all over the place. Uh, and the, so there's a side view uh, for this. And there's going to be small, medium, large ones. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this, and I'm showing you pictures of uh, different insects from different parts of the world. Right? This is not just California, uh, yeah, although we do have them in California. So some of these are going to be from other parts of the world. Uh, this one uh, with the white is to reflect the heat. This is the Namibian desert. Uh, so they are going to be making their home uh, there. Uh, this is here in California. Uh, so this is uh, a beetle that I've always found on uh, the uh, mariposa lilies here in California. So they're good for pollination. Uh, they're covered with pollen. Uh, so this is a good guy. Uh, here's uh, the close-up of those uh, diving beetles. And uh, it's a close-up uh, because, not that I caught it, uh, but it's because uh, people eat them. So insects, beetles are going to be a very good source of protein. Uh, and some of them can be quite big. Uh, so these are beetles that were brought to me from Cambodia. Uh, and uh, so here's uh, just another beetle uh, on a plant. And the, the coloration, some of them are going to be beautiful. Some of them are going to be almost metallic. Uh, and so this is uh, the scarab. And for the scarab, uh, you can look at the uh, antenna. So if you see the antenna, it's going to almost be elbow. It's going to look like an elbow, have an elbow. Uh, and it's going to be very short. Uh, sometimes, the, in this case, the elytra, that shell is a different color. So you can see a very distinct uh, uh, shell or elytra. And uh, you see the nice claws for this one uh, that it's just going to use to uh, anchor itself on the ground as it uh, walks or as it climbs. Uh-huh. Uh um, on the skip. So those are June beetles. Okay, are they scarabs? They are a type of scarabs. Uh, they're not scarabs, but they are a, a beetle. Okay. Or, or let me verify if it's a scarab. Uh, I need to, uh, we might have it here. So let me see. Uh, if it has those those antennae, then it's a it's a wing. It's a it's a scarab, because there's also going to be longhorn beetles, uh, meaning that they are going to have a very long antenna. It kind of looks like horns, uh, and so these are longhorn beetles. These are another native beetles to uh, here in uh, Southern California, also on a mariposa lily. Uh, here's the uh, here they are uh, leaf beetles, uh, and I mentioned metallic. These are feeding on uh, the plant and they are also uh, mating. And that's gonna be inevitable. You go hiking, you start taking a photograph of a beetle and half of the pictures that everybody has about insects, they're, they're mating. Because that's a that's, that's short period of time. Uh, oh 
<laughs> Here's another one that is camouflaged with the flower. Uh, and then this is a different view. So this is underneath uh, underneath uh, uh, the plant. Uh, there's uh, this one here that I got from Brazil. And so here's a bigger and wider photograph of the previous one, the ones that were inside the three of them. Uh, so you see the damage and uh, they don't mind you. Uh, this is a, a firefly. So lightning bugs, so the fireflies or lightning bugs, there are beetles and uh, their uh, juvenile is known as a glow worm. Uh, and uh, it is one of the few animals that have a bioluminescence. Uh, so they create natural light. Uh, the glow worms are gonna be carnivorous and they are gonna use the bioluminescence, they live in caves to kind of attract or fool an insect uh, and when they get close to them they'll either trap it snatch it use some silk or some kind of uh, webbing to try crab it uh, the adults are going to use the bioluminescence to attract a mate so the specific pattern of uh, on and off is going to let uh, this uh, specific female from the species know uh, where they are so then they're going to use the light not so much the pheromone as a way to communicate. Uh, and that's why you see him flying and you see him uh, uh, sparking uh, at certain intervals uh, or for a certain amount of time. Is it bioluminescence? bioluminescence? Is that like a liquid? It's a chemical reaction that occurs in their system. Like grab oil or salt? And yeah. yep, yeah. yep, uh, yep. You just uh, scrape it all over, all its guts into your on your clothing, and it glows for a couple of minutes, and voila, it's there. Yeah. Like, uh, mm, no, they don't last that long. Like no, because <laughs> you just feel the you just whatever chemical reaction what is happening, the chemical you just smear it all over your clothing, and that's why it still kind of glows. Yeah, that was a, uh, uh, no, uh, it's, it's back east and in, uh, in the south, 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 meaning South America. And so in Mexico, we, we also haven't had them in Mexico. But no, I have not seen them here. There's a different view of uh, this one. So this is a, a weevil. Uh, and the family is uh, Curculioneoides. Uh, and uh, the weevils are going to, this is a juvenile, they're going to have a very long snout uh, or their mouth, their face is going to be elongated. Uh, many of them are going to feed on seeds and nuts. And so uh, it's a way for them to penetrate the seeds and be able to kind of make a hole into the seed so that then they can lay an egg. Uh, so this is a weevil. So look for the snout, look for the mouth, uh, and you will see. Uh, some difference. Uh, just another leaf beetle uh, right here. Another uh, like lady beetle type uh, right here, metallic. Uh, this is a soldier beetle. Uh, and if you notice the soldier beetle, look at those jaws. Uh, very sharp, almost like sickle. These are hunters. They are going to run and capture their prey. And when they capture, they're, they're, it's not gonna go away. Uh, so soldier beetles, you find them. Uh, and in this case, uh, we've seen the elytra covering the entire body of the insect. In this case, the elytra is just very small. So it doesn't cover the entire body. This is the abdomen, but this would be considered the elytra for this insect. Uh, so just be aware, it's not always like the, Scarab that you have the entire body covered by a big shell. Uh, so it's gonna be a little bit smaller. Uh, just a leaf beetle on a flower. And uh, these are the scarab or the dung beetles. Uh, and uh, they have a very important ecological niche that's uh, uh, gonna be for them to uh, go follow the cattle, follow the animals, and then collect the dung, put it into a, make it into a bowl, and then push it and make a hole and bury it. And then they will lay the eggs on the dung and that's what the uh, larva is gonna eat. So we know that this group of insects were, uh, 
have an association with the Egyptians. The Egyptians thought that it was a beetle that would bring up the sun and then push it over across the sky and then it will be the sunset. So that's why you find it in a lot of the hieroglyphics and it's, uh, it was a sacred animal. Uh, so that's why in nature you wouldn't see big piles of dung hanging around because there would always be beetles that would uh, push it away and bury it, putting it back in the ground, fertilizing and all of that. Uh, but a lot of them unfortunately got killed or the population decreased when they started to use a lot of the antibiotics uh, on cattle uh, or some of those extra uh, medication. Uh, then it was toxic for the beetles. And so then the patties stayed on the ground and then it hardened and then it became a different story. Uh, but they have their niche. Uh, they can, they'll eat whatever nobody else wants. Uh, leaf beetle uh, right here. It's another leaf beetle. Uh, just the face of a scarab, uh, the metallic one, uh, another leaf beetle, uh, this one that landed on my clothing, and uh, a side view of the long horn beetle, so you can see the very long antennae, and the elytra, another uh, ground beetle, this one kind of resembles a pebble or a small rock, uh, another lady beetle, uh, the, that looks like another lightning bug. Uh, yeah, lightning bug. This is from uh, Suriname. Uh, this one is kind of fat and the elytra is not even closing. Uh, and uh, so this is uh, the scarab uh, on the ground. I was able to take a photograph. Uh, another soldier beetle. Uh, another diving beetle. A leaf beetle. So there's the side view of the weevils. So I mentioned a uh, very long, uh, kind of like a snout. That is their mouth and the, uh, their eyes are gonna be up here. Uh, or, uh, yep, what are the eyes? I never heard of that one. What, what's a love bug? No. No, no, the love bug is, is uh, probably an assassin bug. It's the one that kisses you, right? Like a kissing bug? They're just always stuck together wherever they're flying. Well, they're mating. That's. Yeah, they're flying. Yeah, they're flying. Later on, uh, let's find out. I, I've never heard of that one, so I'm interested to find out if, it, if, it's, if it's a beetle or if it's something else. Because many insects will do that, including uh, like damselflies and dragonflies. They really invade like Florida around spring. Like, it could also be mayflies that come out with very large numbers, or it could be something else. So show it to me later on. And then we'll, we'll dismissify what the love bug is. <laughs> I thought that was a title of a, a show or something like that. <laughs> so we've all. So if you see, I find a, an insect with this very long snout, uh, that is go, probably gonna be a weevil. Uh, and there's just different angles uh, for uh, this individual. Uh, it's another uh, scarab, but this one has a horn. Uh, it almost has an extension of uh, the head to form a horn. And there's uh, the, the dung beetle. So that is uh, the ball of dung that is pushing and this is where the beetles are very strong because if you compare the size uh, of the insect, uh, it's, it's gonna push it. And before it pushes it, it already has to have a, a den or a hole or dug up or find a place to bury it. So it's a lot of work. Uh, and uh, hopefully the ball is gonna roll in the right direction because sometimes it doesn't and it makes their job a little bit more difficult, uh, but that is, uh, that's what they're gonna do. Uh, just a sleeping uh, leaf beetle and a leaf beetle. Uh, these are also going to be very important. These are the metallic wood boring beetle. And so when I mentioned the flat hair borers would be one, the round -head headed borers are going to turn into the metallic wood boring beetle. And they are going to also cause some of the problem uh, with uh, some trees and or kill some trees bark. So. Uh, they're going to have that slender body uh, and uh, they're going to be very shiny. So you, you'll see it. 
All right, so Lady Beetle, Ladybug, uh, this is a click beetle. Uh, and what you need to look for is going to be an extension of the thorax right here into two points. So one here, one here. And it's a click beetle because if you hold it, it's going to somehow move its uh, thorax and uh, abdomen that is going to create a click. And it's going to click and you're going to hear it and you're going to feel it. And so half of the time somebody holds it, they're going to click, they're going to get frightened and they're going to let it go. Uh, so look for it right here. And I think I have different angles later on, uh, but that's we're holding it so that we can uh, make it click uh, so we can try to escape. Uh, scarab, uh, click beetle right here. You can see the extension. Uh, this is the same one when we found it. Uh, and then you have the other extension here. Uh, so harmless, uh, weevil, different views of the weevil. Okay, so those are the antennae right here, sorry. And those are the eyes right here. So those are the antenna. Click beetle, here's the extensions right there. And there are uh, click beetles around here, so they're small. So is that like a separation? No, that is just an extension of the thorax. The, where the dog part is? So this is the this is the separation. So that's the thorax, and that's uh, that's so, uh, the thorax is here. Uh, the abdomen is here and that's the head. So, sorry, an extension of the head, not the thorax. I rephrase that. An extension of the head. Thank you for correcting that. Extension of the head. Uh, scarab sleeping, scarab uh, trying to fly, another scarab. Uh, different views. Here's the antenna, very distinct. There's the rear end. And there's the elytra. Uh, longhorn beetle, long antennae, another firefly, and more weevils. This one's uh, mating and uh, on a milkweed plant. Uh, more leaf beetles, metallic leaf beetles. There's more than three there. Uh, and uh, here we have a leaf beetle, but what's interesting is that it has a mite, so it has a parasite attached to it. And so don't be surprised uh, if you happen to find insects on the ground that are like, why is it not flying, why is it not running away? Uh, if you look closely, they might be infected with their own uh, parasites. And so if you happen to put them under the microscope, you may see other things you were not expecting. That's not a two point. That was kind of two point, <laughs> yes, because you have a mind uh, and uh, the, yeah, like yes, yes, yes. Fine. Look for those mites. <laughs> Don't worry about it. And uh, that's just uh, the legs, just to show you. And uh, the jaws right here uh, for this uh, scarab beetle. And the weevil. And this is coming soon. <laughs> Uh, no, this is the uh, green fig beetle. Uh, the June bugs are brown, and those are come out in June. That's why they call June bugs. Uh, that's when you start seeing them. Uh, so in the summer around here, when the figs are ripening, they're gonna fly everywhere. Uh, they are gonna eat the figs when they are ripened. So the best thing to do is to harvest your fig before they get any big uh, or mature uh, or get fully ripened so that you don't invite them. They will eat any, <laughs> any ripened fruit, they'll eat it. They don't like green, they like ripened fruit. Uh, these are also the grubs, the white big grubs that you see when you dig up the ground. And or if you have a compost bin and you have this big grubs, those are gonna those are gonna be the juveniles. So the juveniles feed on organic matter, decomposing matter. The adults feed and mate on fakes, and they'll fly. They're clumsy uh, and uh, metallic. Uh, so those are will come in soon. So there's the fake being completely decimated uh, by uh, the beetles. There's. Uh, obviously, the lady beetle larva. Uh, so this would be 
another tiny grub for the beetle. Uh, another leaf beetle, leaf beetle, scarab pushing uh, the a smaller ball of dung here. Uh, and uh, one of the largest uh, long horn beetles that uh, I came across, very, very big. Uh, so much so that there's uh, when we uh, somebody held it. Uh, so this specific one has very is from Brazil, has very sharp jaws, and this one will go up to the top of the trees, and it will cut down big branches or thick branches. Uh, so it has that ability. It'll take him some time. That's uh, I think that's a he. Uh, it'll take him some time. And uh, when the branches drop to the ground, then he's going to go to the branch and wait for a female that would want to lay the eggs on that specific branch and mate with her. Uh, but it has to have a very large jaw because again, it has to be able to cut those branches. Uh, so that's the female. That's that's a longhorn beetle. Uh, longhorn beetle, yeah. Uh, just not sure what this one is, uh, but it's. It's a beetle, uh, and that's uh, this is the the bark beetle. This is now the nuisance uh, of uh, Southern California. This one is destroying a lot of trees, uh, especially sycamores. Uh, but now almost every tree is uh, in serious danger because of this beetle. Uh, there's no natural control. It is very small. I think as one of the students found it on our fig out here, and now it's been. Uh, and uh, process. Uh, so look at a tree uh, around trees. Uh, if you see tiny holes, uh, it's probably going to be this one. And it's predicted that uh, what is known as the urban forest, the trees that you see out in the city are going to change because as they keep on getting killed, then they're going to, we have to have to find things that are resistant. What also helped them a lot is the water conservation movement. So when people started to take away the water from their lawn or their landscape, uh, especially in areas that were uh, not being used, where there was a tree, uh, they took away the water because they wanted to cure their lawn. Then they didn't give it a water to the tree that was used to having regular water that put it under stress and now made it a victim to the bark beetles and uh, then the increase in mortality started. So the best thing, keep your trees well irrigated, uh, keep them happy, keep them healthy, and that's going to ward off or at least help in fighting uh, or preventing uh, and not being decimated by this bark beetle. Uh, so bark beetle, there's a lot of information on this because it's so devastating here. Uh, leaf beetle just sleeping. Another leaf beetle sleeping. Another click beetle, big one. So there's the extension of the head. So that's what you're gonna be looking for. Very nice slender body. Uh, mating lady beetles, scarab. So look at those antenna. Okay, see how they're divided into three? If you find that on a beetle and it kind of looks nice and round, it's 99% a scarab. Uh, leaf beetles, scarab right here again, uh, scarab eating uh, cashew in Brazil. Uh, these are going to be just either leaf beetle or passion flower beetles eating passion flowers, award winning passion flowers. I know I was not happy, but okay. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the ground beetle. Uh, this one just happened to found a, find a dead grasshopper. And that's when it's eating, and that's how it raises its rear end if you try to grab it. There. So, doing its job. And uh, that's it for the beetles. Any questions on beetles? Whew. All right. And then uh, the next one, what's my? Uh, it's going to be, I think it's Diptera on your list, right? So we're going to start with this one. No, uh, it's going to be the next big one. We're concentrating on the big ones today. 
uh, then we're going to go the smaller ones later on. So diptera, the flies, uh, flies, um, midges, uh, mosquitoes, and uh, all of its relatives. Uh, diptera, uh, die means, uh, or D means two, and uh, ptera means wings. So it's an insect that has two wings. That's going to be a lot. However, uh, the most important uh, clue, the most important thing that you need to see uh, for putting an insect into the fly category is going to be the modification of the second wing. So we have the first wing right here for flight. And then the second wing or second pair is modified into what we can refer to as a drumstick. Not the chicken drumstick, but more like the musical instrument, that drumstick. So that is now a modified wing. What is the purpose of the second wing now is for stability and for maneuvering in the air. And so you wonder why is it that a fly can turn on a dime is because they have this stabilization mechanism that are gonna make them extremely good acrobat uh, aerodynamic insects and uh, good acrobats in the air. And you reach for them and they're gonna fly away because they can do it. Not like the clumsy beetles that are so heavy that I should just grab them, pick them. So that's what's gonna help uh, flies be one of the best flyers out there. So they have this modification of the wings. And uh, that's why I took this photograph. Well, let's, uh, let's go to this one, because this is gonna be a very serious problem. These are gonna be the fruit flies. Uh, so I'm looking for it and uh, uh, I'll find it. So it's going to, what do we got? There it is. So it's doing its dance. It's uh, signaling to females uh, that uh, are in the area to uh, come and mate with it. There is a lot of work being done in uh, preventing the, uh, the establishment or the introduction of fruit flies into Southern California. So if you ask many folks from uh, Central and South America or other tropical areas in the world, it was not uncommon for people to cut a fruit, start eating it, and then find some maggots. Those are the fruit flies. And so the fact that you can go into your garden here, pick up a guava and eat it without worrying about eating maggots is because we don't have fruit flies around here and they do a lot of work. There's keep them away. So what happens? Uh, the Department of Agriculture uh, raises a lot of male fruit flies, and then they irradiate them to sterilize them. So then they're going to release them. They release them throughout the city. And uh, before they release them, they are going to coat them with a uh, UV powder. Uh, or a powder that can only be seen with a UV light. And so the idea is that the male, the seral males, if they happen to mate with a female because they're seral, the female is not gonna be able to lay eggs. And so she's gonna be down for that. And then she's gonna die. Uh, or this is also when, uh, why they go around and set traps around different fruit trees so that in case there's a female, uh, that goes into the trap, she'll get caught. And then when they inspect them, they can shine some uh, UV light. If they glow, then they know it's uh, the sterile males. If it doesn't glow, then it could be a potential fertile female and that's gonna be a problem. Then they're gonna start spraying and doing a bunch of other things. So we have uh, the Mediterranean fruit fly. They're trying to avoid uh, the Asian fruit flies. And I just heard that there is a guava fruit fly that was discovered here now. So we'll see. Uh, so fruit flies are going to be an agricultural problem only because people don't want to eat maggots. Uh, so they're small. And if you see them doing that little dance, then you know it's a fruit fly. And I think somebody got them, uh, brought them in already. You ready for the right? Uh, so there it is. Uh, sometimes they're going to have different colors. 
Uh, and this is why it's important so that if we find one and we happen to be a female, we supposed to report it uh, so that they know that it's still, because um, we're so close to the port, they bring fruits, vegetables, other stuff. So it's our rightful duty to report it. They put them wherever they see a fit to be to monitor. So they'll put them on the trees, they'll put them nearby. The traps have a pheromone. And so the female thinks that there's a potential male inside there and there's a glue and that's when they're gonna get stuck. And that is also why they say, do not tamper with it, do not touch it, do not bother it because you could be frightening a potential female to go inside and then she'll find a uh, mate somewhere else. Uh, so fruit flies and problem. Uh, here's just a common house fly uh, that I happen to photograph the underside uh, from the window. Uh, so, and uh, some of them that are going to be pollinators. So not all flies are going to feed on decay or, or, or rotten meat. Some of them are going to be good guys. Uh, so there's a close up. That's a fruit fly uh, right there. Beautiful. Uh, and let me uh, this is the ovipositor. So that's the egg laying apparatus. So it has to be able to penetrate the skin of the fruit uh, to lay their, uh, their eggs. Uh, midges or flies, uh, pollinating tomatoes. Uh, that's fly right there. Sarcocholidae. This is like the flesh or the rotten rotten flesh of fly. Uh, the, Oh, this is a mosquito. Uh, so mosquitoes aren't going to be true flies, uh, but now mosquitoes here is that very long stylet mouth part uh, to be able to pierce your skin and be able to eat, uh, drink your blood. Uh, so they, they have their own niche, they have their own areas, and uh, sometimes they have the preferred host, but in the absence of a preferred host, they'll go to something else. They need the protein. And uh, it is only the females that are going to be problematic. The females that need the protein for developing the eggs. Uh, and then uh, the males are just gonna mate, uh, eat pollen, drink nectar, hang out around the flowers and that's it. They're not gonna be problematic. The only problem is if they mate, then the female is gonna be able to lay eggs. And uh, the eggs are then gonna be laid uh, in or uh, in close proximity to the water, uh, so in the vegetation of the water. And so the larva, which is a tumbler, is known as a tumbler, uh, is going to be completely uh, aquatic. Uh, and then it's going to pupate, and then the adult is going to come out of the water and fly around, mate, eat, and then uh, lay more eggs. Uh, so here's a fly. And uh, the other thing with flies and many insects, they're gonna have what is known as a compound eye. So they have a big eye that is made of very tiny, tiny little eyes. And so you wonder like, how can they see me? How can they, uh, how come I cannot catch it? It's because they can see in every possible direction. Uh, so be aware of that. Uh, this is a cray fly. So notice there is no stylet. So when people accuse some poor insect of being a mosquito, it's like, no, did you see the very long stylet mouth part for stabbing you? No, then this is a crane fly. This is not a harmful insect. This is not gonna bite you. This is not gonna dry your blood. Uh, this fits on some decaying matter somewhere. Uh, so look at the mouth part. Uh, here is uh, one of the bigger flies that I found. Also very important with flies, they're gonna have very short antennae. And I'm gonna say that right now, because unfortunately there's gonna be the mimics. There's gonna be flies that may look like bees. Uh, there's gonna be moths that may look like wasps. Uh, and so there's gonna be those mimics that are gonna look like something else as a way of protecting themselves from their predators. Uh, so flies have very small antennae. Uh, and they have those two pair of wings and the second modification or the modification of the second pair of wings. So if you look at those two things, then you should have no problem separating the flies from the uh, some of the bees 
because some flies look like a bee, hum like a bee, go to flowers like a bee, but they're, they're flies. Uh, so here's where I grabbed it by, uh, grabbed it, took the photograph, different angles. There's the abdomen, uh, there's the thorax with the legs, and there's uh, the head with the compound eyes. Uh, this one is a biting fly, so you can see some jaws, jaws here. Uh, so there are going to be the biting flies that can take a piece of your flesh and make you bleed. It's going to be the mosquito type that will drink your blood. Or there's going to be the flies that are just going to feed on whatever is rotten decaying that will have the sponge as a mouth. So depending on their diet, it's going to be uh, their mouth part. And there's a different view. Big eyes, short antennae. Uh, and the antennae uh, are going to have a tiny bristle, like a hair, that can also help you. Short antenna with a tiny bristle, a tiny hair, then you know it's going to be in the fly category. Uh, and this one, see, it's red, so it has been eating blood, not mine. And there's a the side view. And there's the drumstick right here. See it? Right there. Drumstick, true wing, abdomen, mouth, big mouth. And there's a tiny bristle right here on the antenna, a little upward. So fly. Uh, there's going to be robber flies. Uh, these are going to hunt, uh, usually bees. You see them uh, hunting bees. Uh, they're going to uh, hunt uh, and or grab the bees when they're flying in mid-flight. Uh, they're going to grab them in from the back. And then they're going to kind of bite them or stab them and kill them. And then they're going to land somewhere and, and, and eat it. Uh, so it's not uncommon for you to see it, and they're going to be holding a bee. They're not mating, uh, it's eating. So rubber fly, again, small wing, small antennae. There's a drumstick right here. Uh, and the true wings that is in uh, resting mode. Uh, there's a different view. Ooh, it seems to be that. So there is a kind of like a bristly antenna. Uh, tiny midge. Uh, so short antenna, uh, drumstick somewhere here. This one was feeding alongside those uh, weevils uh, on the milkweed. And there's the eyes. Look at them. It's like every single direction. It can see in every direction possible. Hmm? Yep, but there's two. And there it is. So this one got, got a, a wasp. So the rubber fly. It's grabbed it by the back of the neck. Yeah, like a robber, like a, uh, a rogue, a thief. Uh, no, not robber, robber, R-O-B-E-R, -E right? So that was a brave one, got a wasp. Uh, mosquito. Uh, on the side, and this is going to be another very important thing. Uh, so what happens is that the mosquito are going to feed on, on you, on the animal, uh, wherever there's blood. And uh, blood is going to take a long time to process and digest. So right after it bites you or takes drinks or blood, the first thing that is going to happen is that the uh, mosquito is just going to land on the wall and just kind of rest a little, digest the blood. Uh, and that was used as a way of treating the mosquito that would be transmitting malaria because we know that many insects can uh, transmit diseases, including mosquitoes that can transmit malaria. So the way they were controlling the insects or killing them is that they would be spraying the walls with DDT. So that when the insect fed on a village or the people from the village and they went to the wall to rest, they'll come in contact with the DDT and they'll die. Or they'll spray the water to kill the juveniles. Uh, but what's important here is notice how this mosquito has the a pair of legs up. So that is a classic stance. So when you see that, if you're going in close to the insect and you see those legs kind of up, then you know that is a mosquito. Now you add the fact that you can see the stylet here, uh, then you know that, that is definitely a mosquito. This one is now full. You can see a very uh, swollen abdomen. So it found uh, a meal somewhere. Hopefully it wasn't me. Uh, some kind of fungus fly. So don't forget mushrooms, rotting mushrooms. They are gonna be 
loaded with insects. So the reason why you don't eat very old mushrooms is because probably half of the time they already have maggots. Uh, or beetle, there's going to be fungus beetles, beetles that are only specialized in eating uh, fungi and mushrooms. So when you find mushrooms, don't you say, oh, pretty much no. Open it up. Let's see what we find. In this case, there was a lot of what looks like a, we're going to call them fungus fly, but I think they're like fruit flies. Uh, but they were feeding on this uh, fungi. Uh, uh, and they were very happy. Uh, this is what I kind of saw later on. There's a mosquito feeding on the eye of this little birdie right there. So the birdie is sitting on the nest and I took the photograph of the birdie and the birdie obviously is not gonna move because it doesn't wanna be seen. Uh, but then later on I saw like, oh, wow, well, that's kind of sad, but okay. So a uh, mosquito feeding on the eye of that birdie. No, it's cute. Uh, that robber fly right here with uh, the mouth. So that's what uses to stab the back of that bee or the wasp to kill it and then eat it. And so here's uh, the drumstick, you can see it right here. So wing drumstick right there, that's the wing. And that's the fly. So anything on flies, flies, mosquitoes, midges, all of those. So drumstick as a second pair of wing, a bristly antenna, and the rest is, is uh, other characteristics. All right, and then, so from the flies, let's move to uh, the true bugs. So hemiptera. Hemiptera, uh, we know aptera means wing and hemi means half. So in this case, for the true bugs, and these are gonna be the true bugs, so uh, their base or the bottom part of their wings, their first wing is gonna be uh, soft and the upper part is gonna have, be rigid. So half of the wing is rigid. So what you see here as the red and the black and the red, that is gonna be the rigid part like the beetle. And then the thing that you see here as in the black color, that is gonna be a soft wing or a soft turf. And then the second wing is going to be normal for flight. So it's gonna use both of them, but half of the wing is uh, sclerotinized and then uh, half of it is not. And so hemi means half, aptera means wings. So that means half of the wing is sclerotinized. So that's gonna be why the name was given. However, one of the things that you can always look for with the true bugs that I would recommend if you look at the area between the head and the thorax, you can almost visualize or see an inverted triangle. So if you see that, then you're about 90% sure that that should be a true bug. And here you can see the sclerotinization. So you have in the gray black, the sclerotinized uh, wing, and then uh, the clear would be the non-sclerotinized. The other wing is laying in the back. Uh, so, Here's a uh, Wawitsia mirabilis cone. So this were feeding or uh, mating or uh, I don't know if they're pollinating Wawitsia. Uh, mm, oh yeah, uh, this is a uh, predaceous, no, uh, giant water bug uh, that were brought to me from Cambodia to eat. Uh, so there are water bugs that are big, and these are sometimes known as pincher bugs. Uh, and they're in the water, and they're going to be hiding. So it is not uncommon for people to take off their shoes, sandals, go into the river, and all of a sudden they feel like they stab, and they start bleeding. And they don't know what hit, uh, what bit them, and so they say, oh, it's a pincher bug. So yes, they do, they are big probably one of the biggest insects we're gonna find around here. And they can draw blood if you mishandle them. They live in the water uh, and they are big. So sometimes two or three inches in length. So if you go into any of the mountains around here in the stream, pull up some rocks, move the water and you will see or you will find them. So giant water bugs is a true bug. Oh, delicious. They were seasoned to perfection. Can you see the seasoning? crunchy. 
So these are uh, the different types of shield or stink bugs. So if you look at the makeup of the body, they're just gonna look like a shield, one of those all time shields. And then you can see that inverted triangle and that hemi elytra. So half of them sclerosonized, half of them not. Uh, and uh, here's assassin bugs. So these are good guys. So all of the bugs are gonna have a stylet. So that needle like mouth part, if you look at it, that's what they're gonna use to stab their uh, prey. They're gonna drink a liquid diet. So they're gonna stab it and then kind of suck out the insides of the insect. This one is feeding on a scale. Uh, so you see the stylet uh, coming out. The other thing you can see with your true bugs, they're gonna have a very tiny head, especially when you compare it to the mouth part, which is gonna be very long. The head is gonna be very as narrow or very small. And it's almost gonna have like a diamond pattern. I'm gonna say that, but not always, but just kind of very small head, half of the wing sclera is nice, that triangle pattern, style it for a mouth part, you're in the bugs uh, category. Uh, here's a nice, a nice one. Uh, so same category, small head. Uh, there's uh, some of the, like a cicada or a bug that we'll talk later. So there's some of the names, the younger ones, and so that's the adult, uh, the youngs. Uh, it's gonna be incomplete metamorphosis. So the youngs are gonna look, uh, youngins are gonna look uh, a little like a small version of the older ones. So there's a side view of this one that was feeding on a passion fruit in the wild. And you can see the stylet when not in use, it is folded along the body. And sometimes it can reach halfway through its uh, thorax. So it's gonna be very long. Uh, so this is a youngin, another youngin, uh, and uh, leaf footed bugs. This one really pretty. Uh, I would like to add that the bed bug falls into this category, and what I know as the kissing bug falls under this category. So the true bug, uh, the kissing bug is the one that's responsible for transmitting chaga diseases. Uh, so unfortunately it's already, I think it's already been reported in the United States. It used to be very common, uh, sorry, it's coming in the South America and then it's made it, it's making its way up North. And now I think Chagas may be already in, uh, United States and it's transmitted by, not transmitted directly, but it is being moved around by bugs, uh, that feed on people and, uh, the kissing bugs like to uh, stab people in very soft area and that's gonna be the lips. And that's why they call kissing bugs because that's where they're gonna drink your blood out of. So the ones that feed on plant, feed on sap, the ones that feed on animals, feed on uh, their blood. Uh, here's a shield bug, but once again, it has uh, mites. So it has two mites that are feeding on it. Uh, shield bug. Uh, this is uh, the giant water bug. Uh, so look at that front leg that is made into big pincers and you can see a lot of muscles. So this is, this, this can draw blood without any problem. So can you handle them? Yes. If you mishandle, if they feel in danger, then they are going to definitely claw you and you are gonna bleed. This is a giant water bug. So they can come out, they can fly. So this one, I, I was lucky to find it in the airport. I was waiting for my flight overnight for one of my trips. So I was like, oh, cool, look at that. Question. Um, are they found in freshwater? Freshwater, yes. Rivers, lakes, that's where you're gonna find them, in the water. This one just uh, happened to be coming out, running around. I ate a giant water bug just like this, but the one from uh, Southeast Asia. But can you find this and eat them? Yeah. Uh, if you're lucky, uh, if you can find a male giant water bug, uh, you recognize him because the female will lay her eggs on the back and the male job is to protect them. And so if you find a male with a lot of eggs on his back and you know it's a male with scary for it, yeah. 
like three inches in length. So, and, and big muscles and uh, uh, very sharp uh, four legs. So that's why somebody, in every, what happens is somebody takes out their shoes, walks in the water, puts their toe in between crevices, rocks where the water bug is hiding, feels threatened, stabs them, person starts bleeding. It's a pincher bug or it's a, it's, huh? Yes, they have wings. So there's the close up of this one. There's a side view. See triangle, half. Uh, more uh, just uh, leaf bugs. Uh, so here you can see the mouth part being uh, folded on its back, on its front. Uh, just juveniles hanging out. Uh, another one that looks like with wings. Uh, cicadas which uh, we'll talk about later with the homoptera, uh, but the cicadas are gonna be also, now they're in the true bugs, uh, but uh, these are gonna be some of the longest lived insects. They're gonna be underground the whole time, feeding on the roots of plants, and they can be alive. I think the longest recorded has been like 14, 15 years. And then they come out for just a couple of days. They, have, they can sing or they can play, uh, they can make very loud noise, and they're gonna use that loud noise to find a mate. And we, I think we have them in the garden. I haven't spotted them. I need to photograph them and catch them. No, no, potato bug is a cricket. Yeah, they're very loud. Cicadas, not true bug, but we'll put it in the other category, the old category. Uh, just leaf bugs feeding on trees, leaf bugs right here. And a nice shield bug and a passion flower, uh, leaf bugs a bunch of uh, immature uh, bugs, uh, no more bugs, That's probably an assassin bug with a stylet right there compared to the mouth, uh, an assassin bug that is killing and stabbing a uh, some kind of poor insect, assassin bug because they stab them in the back. <laughs> uh, some kind of leaf bug, probably their frass right here. This one has armor. Uh, and the, the milkweed bug. So you need a bug, just find some milkweed, it's there. We have them here, they're everywhere. Uh, milkweed bug, just flower pollinating, probably some aroid. And so here's where I took the photograph uh, of the triangle. So you can see it. And that's, that's it for the bugs. So from the true bugs, now we can look at the homoptera, uh, but the homoptera in the newest treatment is going to be also a true bug, okay? But for our purpose, we are going to separate this uh, specific group because this specific group that used to be called homoptera, uh, homoptera meaning same wings or equal wings, are gonna all be plant feeders. And so these are going to be the ones that are going to be the more problematic in the landscape in the garden. With a few exceptions of the milkweed bug and a few other bugs, those are not really a problem. But this subsection of the true bugs is going to be 100% plant feeders. And so these are the ones that you should be concentrating on. And so we mentioned uh, the cicada. So this is the cicada in Griffith Park. So this would be the native cicada. They're not as big as the one from the tropics, obviously. Uh, and uh, they do have a uh, stylet as a mouth part. So they all do because their diet is gonna be the sap of the plant. And so they'll have to stab the bark or the root. And that's how they're gonna drink their, uh, their, their food. Uh, so these are the adults. It was making noise. If you go hiking, you can hear them. And if you get close, they'll stop. What you gotta do is not, don't move. And then you see them, or you hear them again, get closer to the sound and then stop if it stops singing. And then eventually you get close enough where it's gonna sing and you'll be able to detect it. Take some time, uh, but if you're patient, you will be able to see them. They're camouflage as well. So it's not like, oh, there it is. 
take some time because I don't want to be spotted by uh, an, uh, the wrong individual. Uh, so there's the cicada uh, in Griffith Park. So these are going to be the tree hoppers, and these are the immatures. I know some of you started bringing some of this. Uh, so tree hoppers, they're going to look armor. They're going to look hideous. They're going to look awful. They're going to look like some horrible monster from a sci-fi sci -fi movie. Uh, so we'll show you the, the adult later on. Uh, but these are going to be, this is the photograph of a leaf hopper. So there's tree hoppers and there's leaf hoppers. The leaf hoppers are going to resemble a very small cicada. So they're going to have a slender body, kind of long and narrow, almost like a torpedo. And uh, you can start looking for some of the characteristics. Here's their antenna, also almost like hair. And uh, the stylet is right here. So it's folded once again uh, towards the thorax when it's not in use. When it's in use, it's probably going to be inside the vascular system of a plant. And so here's where I have the side view with the mouth and the stylet uh, right here. And uh, this is what some of you have brought in. So this is the juvenile. Uh, fortunately, the spikes are not sharp. So you may feel them, but they're not going to stab you. It's made just to kind of deter maybe, or maybe some other smaller insect that wants to feed on it. It may be sharp enough for them, but for humans, uh, it's not going to be too sharp. This is a tree hopper. Uh, that looks like a, some kind of mealybug or mite, like a juvenile mealybug. Two for one. So these are the leaf hoppers, again, a slender body, kind of like cicada. I know some of you have already brought some of this. Uh, these are the different scale, cotton cushion scale that I showed in the beginning. Uh, look for certain specific plants, citrus, they all have this. Uh, so cotton cushion scale, and this is where it just looks really horrible, completely covered with uh, uh, that. Uh, the mealybug uh, that Ray just mentioned. So this is a photograph with, through the microscope. Uh, look for little crevices, nooks and crevices in between leaves. That's where they like to hide. They have the cotton material that they use to uh, protect their eggs and also themselves, and that's how they build a colony. Uh, so mealybugs. Uh, there's going to be also uh, psyllids, uh, and these are uh, these are eucalyptus psyllids. They're Eugenia psyllids. Uh, so um, there's now tipu tree psyllids, uh, and I know there's a brand new one that I don't remember, but uh, psyllids are also going to be a problem. A eucalyptus uh, lerp psyllid destroyed trees in 2000, early 2000. That was the beginning, and then the bark beetles, and now there's a lot of other things. So eucalyptus lerp psyllid. Uh, the white is going to be, looks like some uh, other insect, and uh, some other insect. Ooh, good question. I'll, I'll look for it. I'll magnify it later. Uh, no, it's magnified now. Uh, it, it's probably just another insect that is also feeding on books. Could be a maggot. So there's a salvia and a different view. Uh, aphids, you've all brought them. A plant louse, they come in every size, different colors, different shapes, uh, with or without wings. Uh, their color is by species and also by what they're eating. So you're only allowed one aphid. So don't say, oh, I got a yellow one. I got a green one. I got a pink one. I got a darker one. Like, no, it's just an aphid. Mm -hmm. So what you need to look for is kind of like a pear-shaped body. Uh, and then in the back of the aphid, there's going to be two small protrusions. They're called, they're called cornicles. And that's, when, uh, that's where they're going to secrete an alarm pheromone. So when there's a ladybug that's going to be eating them, uh, then they will let your uh, fellow, they let the fellow that there's a predator so that they can fly away. What is it called? Aphids. A -p no, Cornicles. Yes. And uh, there's a roller for scale. Uh, and just, uh, yeah, yeah. so you see those dark areas right here? So look for those cornicles, pear shape. Uh, very soft. It's an aphid. They're all over. Every plant has them. Uh, this is a, a, a wing one. So, so when they're going to fly, 
Uh, they're going to go and colonize new areas. They'll have wings. So still the same effort. Do they all have wings? No, it's only during a specific time when they are going to fly and colonize new areas. Okay, so will that be a plane? No, 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 no. No. So just uh, a pheromone. So when the colony of aphids is on a plant and there's overwhelming the plant and there's just so many that they're stepping on one another, kicking each other, it's just so crowded. Then a pheromone goes out to the entire group and the next group of aphids that are born or hatch will develop wings. Then those fly away so that they don't keep crowding the area and they go and find a different plant to feed on and that's how they move around. But no, they're not queens. They're, that, that will only be found in uh, the bees wasps that have a cast system. Uh, and this is, we'll see uh, natural enemies later on, but this is one of those uh, uh, parasitic, uh, parasitic wasp. So there are tiny wasps that you can purchase that will kill or help with the population or controlling the aphid. Uh, so this is just uh, the green uh, aphid. I think this is like a broccoli kind of camouflage. Some wings, some not, some different stages, so some smaller. Uh, leaf uh, hopper, just on top of a, looks like a sage. Uh, wax scale, very common. Look at pass, uh, the award-winning passion flowers. It somehow this uh, specific scale likes them. Uh, with the scale, uh, what's important is that there are going to be two stages. Uh, when an egg is hatched, what is going to hatch from the egg is going to be something that looks like a very small aphid with legs and uh, body and everything else. Those are going to be known as the crawlers, and they are going to crawl out look for plants to feed on. And once they begin to feed, uh, then they are going to abandon the movement. Then they're going to become sedentary, no longer move for the rest of its life, keep feeding on the plant. Then they create the shell around them as protection and they'll die. And the females will lay their eggs uh, underneath them and kind of protect them. And when the youngs hatch, the crawlers hatch, it's going to burst out and that becomes the migratory phase. So there's a migratory and a sedentary phase, crawler scale. So when people say, how did this scale find my plant in this room over there away from every, the garden? Because insects are crawling and they're so small that they don't see them. So wax scale, different scales, uh, look at plants. Sometimes it might look normal, but uh, it's an insect. Ray brought uh, the citrus scale that he didn't even know. Uh, his uh, citrus oranges were covered with scales because it kind of blended in. That's, they don't want to be seen. So wax scale, different scales, bring a few of them uh, just for scale. Here's the special flowers. Mealybug, scale for scale. Uh, mealybug, uh, kind of the cottony uh, material. Uh, juvenile tree hopper, uh, just aphids here, uh, mealybug, uh, like a ladybug, some kind of beetle. What's it doing here? Wrong picture. Uh, just aphids on uriops, uh, and aphids, different stages on what looks like potinia, wings, non wings, and everything else. Uh, let me go back here. And this is when they're feeding. So you can see their mouth part in this one that is inserted into the plant. So when they feed, they kind of raise their up lower body so that they can uh, then extract the sap. So that's when they're feeding. Uh, and these are the adult psyllids. So this is the Eugenia psyllid. The juvenile is right here. So they create these little bumps uh, where they're feeding. And when they become an adult, uh, they come out like this. I'm gonna say this might be a male that might be mating on a female because for the scale uh, and many of these insects, it is the females that are gonna be the problem. The females are gonna be the ones that are gonna be feed on the plants. The males for scale and mealybugs look like an aphid like this. Their only job is to mate with the female and then they go away. So you will rarely see them. 
Uh, so this is an adult, could be a male, could be a female. Uh, might be made right there. Uh, spittle bug or spit bug. Uh, juvenile underneath the spit. The adults are known as frog, frog bugs because they're gonna look like a frog or they kind of resemble a frog. So when you're looking for this, uh, look around. If you see things like kind of flying, small things flying, they are gonna be probably the adults. Catch a few of them and let's bring them in because they're kind of cute to see. Yeah. Uh, spittle bug or spit bug, or sometimes the adult is gonna be known as frog bugs, separating it from psyllids and a few other things. Uh, you know, may, uh, feeding uh, aphids. That's what they they do. They ra raise their abdomen to feed. You see the cornicles right here? Those care like structures. Uh, photograph, a lot more. And so when I mentioned numbers before, if you look at every inch of this stem, it's covered with an aphid. It's been sucked. Well, the sap is being sucked by an insect. So there's obviously gonna be very little to no sap that is gonna go to the top portion of this stem. And so that's when the insect can overwhelm and the top portion of the plant is gonna die and suffer. Uh, uh, the cicada. So this is when, uh, to show you the molting process that I talked about before. So the cicadas are gonna lay their eggs in branches or on the crevices of uh, the bark of trees. When they're hatched, they're gonna go in, drop to the ground and they're gonna bury themselves and they're gonna live underground for many years, feeding on the roots of trees. And then they're gonna come out, burst out of the ground and they're gonna climb the tree. When they climb the tree, then they're gonna go to the molting process and become an adult. And so I mentioned that molting usually occurs or starts when the insect breaks the back of the exoskeleton. So this is also a good uh, picture of the exoskeleton that is left behind. Uh, and so that could also be a very good clue. So if you start finding like insect skeleton leftovers from their molting, that can help you to also uh, give you clues as to what the problem is. Uh, and so once the cicada becomes an adult, now it has wings and it, when it becomes uh, dry and everything, it'll fly, leaving behind its uh, skin or skeleton behind, and that's what you're going to find. So that's where it came out from. Uh, and so, big, big. Uh, I think our special components or special things in their in their thorax. I don't know if it's like air or something. I know that. Crickets also do sounds, but uh, we need to find out. I, I, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, that's a, a an adult tree hopper. Uh, so they're gonna have a very broad head and a very slender abdomen. Uh, the head is right here. There's the eyes. So it's gonna have almost like a big forehead. So there's the eyes. The mouth is below it, and there's the wings. So this is probably the head right here. And since the wings are attached to the thorax, this is the thorax kind of fused. And so that's going to probably the abdomen. What is this? This is a tree hopper. Another form. It's a different view. Uh, uh, leaf hopper, kind of slender cicada looking, mini cicada. Uh, scale with uh, ants. Uh, this is uh, the glass wing sharpshooter, which is nothing more than another of those leaf hoppers. This was responsible for killing a lot of trees and transmitting what is known as the scorch diseases. So this is another problematic, so let's find it. Uh, so it is the feeding of the insect uh, and capturing a bacteria and then transmitting it to a different plant, like a mosquito can transmit malaria to people. This is they can transmit uh, scorch diseases to different plants. Uh, so glass wing sharpshooter, which is a, that's their actual name. Uh, they're gonna be big, bigger than the regular leaf hopper. Uh, see, they kind of look like a frog as well, right? Uh, this is uh, this uh, lerp for the psyllid. So I mentioned the psyllid and I mentioned uh, the lerp. 
the word lerp is used for the structure they make for, uh, for as a house. So this is a product of uh, the sap. In this case, all this white is uh, made by the insect, is their home. Uh, they can go in and out. Some, some psyllids don't move in and out. They just kind of stay in one spot. Uh, but this one can move in and out, They're going to different homes and or hide. Uh, and so here's uh, how they look. This one is, looks almost like the uh, bones of a ske or skeleton of a fish. So that can be a clue. So if you go to eucalyptus, you'll find this one, especially the blue gum, uh, blue gum or, uh, or spotted gum, you'll find uh, this uh, psyllid. So psyllids. Uh, no, I think it's done through the rear end. So like the spittle bug will make a spit like material. The lurch psyllid will use it to create this specific uh, home. Yes. Uh, these are lace bugs, and they're beautiful. Here they are. See it? Uh, and this is just uh, all their droppings. So there's some of the juvenile. So look underneath of tree, uh, the leaves of trees. Uh, usually in sycamores, you find the uh, lace bug because their back is kind of very lacy and very very nice. Uh, it could be very nice. So more of those. Uh, tree hoppers and the adult. So here in the green, they are going to look like thorns. Uh, and, uh, or you can find them in roses and uh, it might be a little bit sharp here, but the best thing is to grab them by the edge of the hair, the head, those spikes, you can grab them like that and they don't move. They cannot go, go anywhere. Uh, but in this case, the adult are going to resemble or hide pretending to be thorns on a stem. Uh, so there's the adult, there's the juvenile, different stages, but all those green ones here, the darker green, those are the adult tree hoppers. You find them around members of the nightshade family. So potatoes, tomatoes, uh, night blooming jasmines, all of those will usually have them. And there's a close up of them. So you grab them by this little protrusion of the head. A lot of juveniles here, and there's where I'm grabbing them. So that's the bottom on their side. So that's the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. There's the top, and there's the side. Scales uh, congregating on the veins of the leaves because that's where there's going to be the sap flow. Scales. Oh, this one is oyster scale because they kind of resemble oysters. More lace bugs, you can see them right here. Lace bugs, lace bugs. Another cicada, some other mealy bug looking thing. Uh, that shouldn't be here. That's a powder wasp. Uh, that looks like a uh, white fly. So the white flies. Uh, those are also going to be a problematic. Uh, so they're going to be like mini tiny flies. And I think I have a closer photograph later on. Uh, the juvenile or some of the scales. So these are when they're still, when they're barely developing that uh, rigid or the darker shell. Uh, and you can still see their legs in this case. So these are now becoming sedentary. And there's a close up showing the legs, six of them. Uh, that's a spittle bug. Uh, we, we got a good picture, right, Ray? So, so there's the, the rear end and there's all the spit, all the liquid that it used to cover itself. Spittle bug. And that's it. So there's going to be more, but those are going to be the plant feeding ones that we put them in a different order or we using the old order of uh, Pomoptera uh, for them. All right, one more. Uh, Hymenoptera is going to be the bees, wasps, and the uh, ants. And these are going to be the stinging ones. So let's see what. Uh, uh, okay, start right here. Right. So we're going to start here. Uh, Hymenoptera, 
uh, means uh, hymena means uh, a membrane and aptera means wings. And it's going to be talking about the membranous veins on the wings of this group of insects. And the veins becomes very important when you're going to be determining the different groups of wasps that are out there. Uh, but there's going to be three main categories. There's going to be wasps, there's going to be bees, and there's going to be ants. Okay, and we'll figure out those two. So for the ants, sorry, for the wasps that we have right here, what are going to be going to be looking at? Uh, we're going to look for a very long antennae. Sometimes they're going to it's going to bend like an elbow. Sometimes, but you're going to see a very slender waistline right here. So that's the abdomen, and that is the beginning of the abdomen. So when there is that very slender waist uh, waistline then you know that it's probably a wasp. And then you add that, uh, some of the wings that are going to be membranous. And if you squeeze uh, the rear end, you might see the stinger. So this is going to be one of the few groups that are going to sting that I mentioned before. It is the modified egg laying apparatus that has become a defense mechanism for stinging. Uh, so that's going to be the wasps. Most wasps are not going to be bad, so don't be afraid of them. Uh, most wasps are just going to be free living. This is uh, army ants. They're carrying their younger brothers and younger sisters. So those are the brood. Not exact, those are actual uh, larvae. This is where we have the cast system. So there's normally going to be one fertile queen uh, with lots of workers that are all going to be females. And uh, this is also where there's going to be soldiers for defense. And there's also going to be house cleaners. And there's going to be a bunch of other ants that are going to have specific duties. So the queen is the only one that is able to lay eggs because when she's laying eggs for her offspring, she will spray them with a pheromone that will prevent the development of their reproductive system. So she kind of slaves them. So when you hear about royal jelly, uh, when a bee colony is trying to make a brand new queen, they'll give her royal jelly, which is very nutritious. And uh, that allows for that bee to become a lot stronger, have very well good, developed reproductive system so that now she can fly out, mate, and then come back and start laying eggs and is a new queen. So it's based on the pheromones and the diet that determines the queen. And the same thing for ants. So you have an ant queen that is going to keep all her daughters as, I want to say slaves, uh, but as a working and they cannot reproduce. And all they do is tend the colony. So here, this is army ants. They're moving from area to area. Some of them are going to be hunting. If they happen to find a stupid insect in the way, they're going to capture sheer numbers. They're going to have very large, strong jaws. They're going to have a stinger. And some of them are also going to be, or they're also going to have a fumic acid. So the family for ants is going to be formicity, or you're going to see formic because of some of them have the ability of that formic acid. So they're going to take care of the juvenile. So what you see there are some of the juvenile that they cannot move. They're going to be completely dependent on their sisters to care for them, to feed them, to clean them. And then uh, when they move home, they're going to pick up a sister and run away uh, and move to the new area. And so they're now marching to their new area. What happens to the male ants? You said you're afraid of the dogs. What happens to the bees? Uh, <laughs> there's usually no male ants. <laughs> so like bees, yeah. uh, the drone, only during the spring when there's going to be the flight, when there's going to be future queens that are going to be made, produced, 
then what happens is that the female will, sorry, not the female, the queen will fertilize an egg or several eggs and the fertilized eggs become the drones or the male. So it has to do with uh, whether it fertilizes them or not. So then the males are tolerated because they don't work. They're drones, they don't sting, so they cannot defend. Uh, their only job is to, in the morning, they fly up in the air, they congregate in big numbers, and then a potential virgin future queen will fly through the swarm, and whoever is able to catch her can mate with her, and that's how they, they will select the runty ones that they don't want for, uh, to, to father the next generation. And so... At the end of the day, they come back, they get fed, they get taken care of, and then they go back day, day after day to just try to find mate or win the, the hand of the future queen. If food is uh, lacking, the males are thrown out of the hive because they have no, they serve no purpose. Their only purpose is to be made with a potential uh, queen. That's it. Uh, some of the ants, uh, most of them are going to be, if there's any kind of male, uh, I don't think there's male, but I'll verify that. But I think they're all female, as far as I know. Yes, Gloria? Um, so for um, this order, are they having all the ants that they handle well? Okay. Yes. Y yes, uh, this is where you're going to find like the honeybee. This is where you're going to find some of the, the wasps. The ants will have a cat system. However, this would be the larger colonies because there's also bumblebees are going to be solitary. Yeah. So there, there is no cat system. It's just a solitary bee who's going to find a mate and raise her, uh, raise uh, her uh, the young herself. So you can think of it as a solitary bees are going to just form small villages, kind of each one individually in their home and kind of working independently. Or when you have the actual hive, you can think about it as a city where it's a grouping that makes everything work, the whole group. The same thing the Some wasp will have a cast system. So there is going to be also a queen wasp that will lay the eggs of all the females. And, uh, and then, uh, but some of those colonies are not, not going to be near as big as an ant colony that could have millions of uh, females or a bee colony that could have thousands of individuals. So it depends on the species. Uh, so different ants, uh, this one, obviously. Any other questions? Uh, uh, army ants. Uh, here we go. Let's see. Army ant. Should have sound, but I'm not sure. <laughs> oh, there we go. Start from the beginning. I think there's the next video is going to show you some of the guards. Hopefully, you see some of the guards. Some of those look better than the other ones. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So the fatter ones, the bigger ones, those are the soldier ants. So they're bigger because they have to defend the colony. Okay. They're, all female. they're all females. Yes. <laughs> Yes, ants, bees, and wasps is in 99% of the insects. Most of them are going to be females, or the problems will be females. Female mosquitoes, females for uh, Homoptera, females for wasps, they can only sting you, females for bees. Yes, yes, yes. Because that's how they found that they are successful. So yes, the, 
<laughs> but, but in this case, it's only one queen that does any kind of reproductive. So some of the ants or even some of the bees, the workers do lay eggs, but they're unfertile. And the youth queen usually eats them because it's protein. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So at some point they figure that males are useless and they're just like, who needs men, right? <laughs> the queen mates once in her life. So when she's a, a, a virgin princess, she's gonna fly through the a colony of Rome and whoever catches will mate for her and that's it. That's, that's a mating for her entire life. Once she goes back to the colony, all her duties is to kind of control the colony and lay eggs. The only, the only insect that has an actual king are gonna be termites where you have a queen and a king. No, she would, well, yeah, because then she's dead, but she'll keep laying eggs. Her, her entire duty is keep laying eggs because they need the numbers to bring the food, to care for the young, to have take care of the nest and expand the nest and all of that. But she will be laying eggs when she goes back and starts laying eggs. That's going to be her sole duty. In addition to controlling the colony through pheromones, so she keeps them in check. And that's why if the, something happens to the queen, there's usually a lot of fighting because there's no control until the new queen kind of re, I guess is reestablished. So there's a chaos of the, not having a monarch in, in the, in, on the throne. So they, female workers, they eat them. Yes. So there is a male, there's a female. In the female category, you have the queen, the workers, the soldiers, the nannies, mm -hmm. the laborers, Ah, so we saw, so they're carrying the larva, the, uh, their sisters. Uh, and then we have the paper wasp. So these are gonna be wasps and now we can look at them as far as how they make their home or what material they use them. We know that honeybees have uh, evolved to make a hive uh, out of wax. And so honeybees have special wax glands and they'll secrete flakes of wax. And there's the workers that are gonna be picking up the wax. They're gonna chew it and they're gonna build their little hives. Well, paper wasps do not have that. So they go to different plants. They chew the leaves, take the cellulose and then build the paper and build their home. Usually underneath a structure because obviously paper can get absorbed water. And if it gets wet, it's not gonna be a problem. So when they say, well, humans developed paper a couple of dozen years ago, like, no, wasps developed paper way before humans. Uh, they have paper and they build their homes. So this is paper wasps. Some of the hornets or yellow jackets that we see here, they are a type of paper wasp. So they build their home uh, out of paper. Uh, so this one has a nice entrance. Uh, this is in Mexico. Uh, here's uh, some of the bumblebees. So these are gonna be solitary. So there's gonna be a male out there who's gonna mate with them. And then the females uh, may make uh, their home either burrow in the ground or some of them may bear, uh, find a nice area where they can make their home, usually underground. No, 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 because it all depends on where or what they make their home. Uh, they don't want to be near where they, somebody can just grab them, even though they can defend it. So the paper wasps are usually going to, around here is going to be on the eaves of the house because it's nice and shady and protects uh, them. Uh, most of the bumblebees or the solitary may make their homes underground, so they dig a little burrow. There's also the paper cutters that would like to have bamboo or some kind of uh, hollow area to make, uh, make their own homes. And there's also carpenter bees that are able to chew through woods and create cavities, and that's where they make their home. So it depends on where they, what, which, which animal and where they live. So some of the bumblebees here, 
uh, and uh, ants that are sold uh, for eating uh, and they're delicious. So yes, uh, ants provide some good nourishment for people. There they are. Uh, and uh, here is uh, what we like to refer to as uh, some of the parasitic wasps. And this is when, I guess again, I don't want to bother with going to specific this, uh, specific name for this uh, wasp, but there's going to be the family Ichneumonity. So if you say it's a Ichneumonic wasp, that means it is a parasitic. Uh, and uh, it parasitizes caterpillars, it could parasitize grubs, it could parasitize other ants, and that's why there's going to be defense and needed for the ants. So their role is to lay the egg on a different organism that will then be killed by the developing larva. So this doesn't really take care of her young. She just puts the egg onto a, uh, a different grub and then the youngster is there on its own. So you can normally detect them because they're gonna have a very long ovipositor. So that, that, that will be the stinger. This do not sting people, by the way. Uh, but they have that very long egg laying apparatus because some of them are going to have to find a grub inside the bark of a tree and they'll find it through either hearing or pheromones. They'll be able to detect it, puncture through the bark or somehow make a hole and then lay the egg inside the insect. So ignomonic wasp or what we refer to as a parasitic wasp. And the little one that we show for the aphid will be fall, not in this category, but it's also parasitic. Question? Yes, I think Palette brought found one. So yeah, they're all over. They're they're all over, all over the garden. Uh, here's a, another one. Uh, a wasp. Uh, that's the ignomonic from a different view. So very slender waistline, very long antennae, but very long egg laying apparatus, and you can see the membranes of the wings or the veins. There's a different view. Uh-huh. It's the stinger that is modified on bees and or other uh, members of the family that can able to sting you, yes. Correct. So be, the so bees are expendable because all they do is work. So and they're gonna have to defend the colony. And because they're sterile, then they have no need for a real stinger. So it's just a defense mechanism. Uh, and what happens if you were whoever brings a bee? Let's look at this. Ah. Uh, huh? Okay. So we'll dissect it. And what happens with the stinger or the modification of the bar of the stinger is that it has bars going the opposite way. So once it goes into the animal, then I, the, the bee wants to make sure that all the venom goes in. So if the animal is able to just pluck them out, then the, the animal can, the colony can still be in danger. So by sacrificing themselves, they're gonna sting the animal and then the bars are gonna prevent the stinger from being pulled out easily. And so the only way that it's really gonna be able to be pulled out is not really pulled out, it's gonna be the, the bee is gonna lose its lower abdomen. And so once it does that, then it's no point in living. So that's why it's because of the makeup of the barb uh, stinger and the inability to retract it from wherever it gets stuck. That's why. The side view of uh, uh, wasp, uh, and here you can see the kind of like a elbow antennae right here, but I know I have a better photograph for those. There's more you can do money. Uh, again, a wasp, paper wasp, uh, nice slender waistline right there. Side view, paper wasp. Uh, this is ants. So how are you going to determine or separate the ants from the wasp? Keeping in mind that some wasps are not going to have wings. And when they don't have wings, they look exactly like an ant. Okay. So what you need to look for, if you look at the waistline of an ant, it's going to have bumps. 
So sometimes it's going to have like different, uh, uh, I'm going to say like little mountains going up uh, and the size and the number and all of that is what is being used to separate the different species of ants or the different ants that are out there. So if you look at the waistline of a member of this family, you can say, okay, it's kind of one was uh, B. If it has bumps on its waistline on the slender part, then it's definitely an ant. Because there's gonna, I'm gonna show you a uh, velvet ant, which is actually a wasp. Uh, so here you can kind of see it right here, but I know I have a better picture. Very large uh, mandibles because they can bite. Uh, this is the leaf cutter ant, and uh, you can see it, the bumps right there. See it? It's a little mountain here and another little mountain right there. So that's an ant. Uh, leaf cutter ants are uh, some of the older fungi growers. So they cut the leaves, take them back into their uh, den, and then uh, create a compost uh, where the fungi, special fungi, is grown or feed upon the compost. And the diet of the insect is going to be fungi. So they're completely, uh, well, I don't know if they're vegetarian, but they eat fungi. That's all. The fungi gets uh, eaten by everybody. Uh, and they can defoliate trees. Uh, this one is protecting a award-winning passion flower, but look at the jaw. When I see this in the wild, I don't touch it. This is this one belongs to this ant because it can sting. And compared to the head, look at the jaws. Uh, some smaller ones just uh, taking nectar from the glands. It's another award-winning passion flower. Uh, a tiny uh, bees. Some of them. These are solitary. There are such a thing as non-stinging bees, so they do not sting. Uh, and there's also metallic bees. Uh, so these are just tiny ones. This made their home uh, in this uh, bract of uh, an award-winning passion flower. Let's see if I have the video. So I kind of kind of tapped it. And they all come out to defend. And when I tap that again, then they become really agitated. So they all call out to duty. So they defend the plants. This is their home. They're kind of have probably their young sisters there. Uh, a wasp, again, slender, no bumps. That's a wasp right there, pollinating uh, ant. Uh, right here, feeding on the nectar, paper wasp. Underneath a branch, another ichneumonidae uh, side view. Uh, more cutter, leaf cutter ants. I might have a photograph of them, video. Uh, this one is a tiny paper wasp that was uh, helping me clean the seeds of the passion vine. So it's taking some of the pulp from the seeds. So I thank her for it. Uh, these are the army ants, but these are the soldiers. So the soldiers, if you see them, they are looking up. Uh, and this I see right here. You see them, they're kind of kind of solid in the ground with a nice stance, and the jaws are looking up. So as their sisters are marching in the center, they are on either side of uh, the line. And they're like going back and forth with their jaw, letting anybody know that if you attack them, there's going to be trouble. So those are the soldier ants that are protecting the sisters on either side as they march. Uh, and I might have a video, maybe. I remember. There you go. So this is a colony, and you see the soldiers in the center of the line and the soldiers on either side. So nobody's going to touch them. Uh, bumblebee. Uh, so this one with a very long mouth, uh, very long to be able to probe into some of the smaller florets uh, from some of the sunflowers. So bumblebee. And uh, a very, not a bee, but it's a very interesting wasp here, a very slender waistline. I think this is in Florida. Uh, there's the bumps. So that's an ant right there. Uh, this is the carpenter bee. So this is what we find around here. So the big, big bee, the biggest bee that we have around here is a female carpenter bee. The males are brown and uh, kind of not brown, but uh, kind of golden in color. 
And what happens, the males are going to be territory because they want the females' attention. And when you get close to them, they're going to come to your face and kind of, kind of shoot you away. And if you ever want to see something really funny, hummingbirds are territory and male carpenter bees are territory. So when they cross paths, they're about the same size. And then you see one chasing one the other way, and then, then coming back, they chase the one the other way. And there's just the fight between a male carpenter bee and a hummingbird is really nice to see if you ever get a chance. But knowing that the males don't sting, if you ever want to impress somebody, if it's the copper color one, just grab it. <laughs> and you're just going to start buzzing and, uh, and uh, it's not going to be happy. It's going to be really angry, but it's not going to sting you because it's a male. It doesn't do that. Uh, and then we have what is known as tarantula hawks. And this is one of the largest uh, wasps that you're going to find here in California. Uh, the genus is Pepsis, like the soft drink. Pepsis, and they're tarantula hawks. Uh, tarantula hawks because they look for spiders. So some of the big ones probably look for the native tarantulas. The ones in South America look for even bigger tarantulas. But there is a big group of spider wasps that are going to look for spiders. They're going to be crawling along the ground looking for spiders then. When they find the spider, they're going to force it to come out, and then it becomes a fight not really a fight, the wasp needs to sting the tarantula somewhere in the leg. And when it stings it, it's going to inject a paralyzing venom. It doesn't want to kill it. It wants to paralyze it. When it paralyzes it, then the wasp is going to drag that spider into a den, some hole. Uh, and then when she puts it in the bottom, the wasp is going to lay one egg on top of that tarantula, and the tarantula is alive, unable to move, and when that baby wasp hatches, it's going to start eating it alive, unable to move. Uh, and I have video, I, I actually got some video so I can show you uh, next time when uh, one of these wasps is dragging a spider into the, into its den. And so lays its egg and then uh, buries the tarantula, so covers it. So in tubes, the tarantula, and what comes out is just uh, the mature adult uh, wasp. That starts the cycle. So uh, beneficial, and well, beneficial, they're out there, they kill spiders. Uh, so spider wasp, paper wasp. Bees, uh, this is, uh, an, oh, so this is uh, the Argentine ant that we have around here. This is when they got flooded in the parking lot. But I want to show you that is the female or the queen, much, much bigger than the other smaller one or the workers. So I was able to capture them when they, I think the uh, sprinklers didn't shut off and everything got flooded. Uh, so our uh, uh, Argentine ants, uh, the ants are going to protect some of the plant feeding insects because the ants are going to rely on the honeydew or the insect poop from the, having a liquid diet. They're going to uh, secrete a liquid poop, which is going to be sweet because it's made of the sap. And so the ants are going to protect. It's going to be the insects are going to be treated like a cattle or like a herd of animals, farm animals, where the ants are going to protect them. They're going to move them around to better parts of the plant where there's better grazing. If it gets too cold, the ants are gonna push them underground where it's nice and warm. And when it's nice and warm outside, they're gonna bring them out and herd them out into the plant. Protect them from uh, natural predators and take care of them and milk them. And that's how they get their food. So that's, and there's also gonna be uh, gall forming wasps. So wasps that are gonna inject a hormone and an egg on a plant. And it's gonna create a tumor and uh, the baby wasp is going to eat the tissue of the tumor of the plant. Uh, and so this one happens to come, be coming out of uh, the tumor right here, or maybe laying an egg. But there's also wasps that could cause this, also flies and a bunch of other insects. So gall forming, and that's what we are going to be trying out from the other plant you have. Uh, just a small bee uh, feeding on jackfruit, uh, paper wasp starting their colony. Uh, big bumblebee. Uh, this is South America, and we actually just got a, a big one here yesterday. We saw it for the first time. 
so this is uh, the trap that you'll see for some of the, uh, what we call the paper wasp yellow jackets. The problem with the yellow jackets or the wasp that we have here uh, is that at some, during the juvenile stage, the larva stage, they are going to be carnivorous. And so what happens here, this is the old zoo in Griffith Park, people go out into a, to the park to a picnic, they have burgers, the wasps are looking for protein. So if they find a burger, they'll start taking some of the meat. Normally they should go to plants and get the caterpillars, get the grubs, capture insects to feed to their juvenile. Uh, but that's where the problem of them becoming a nuisance or become a nuisance to the park patrons and to people. Or if you're outdoors in your house and you see the wasps running around, flying around, then know that they're looking for the meat. What I suggest is take a piece of the meat and just put it somewhere else over there where they can go and find it uh, and not bother you. So you kind of feed them and keep them out of your way. That doesn't happen with bees because bees are probably the only insect in this group that is 100% vegetarian. So pollen and nectar and this, uh, the, 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 the leaf cutter ants and maybe some of the other powder ones. Uh, but as far as like the, the, the wasp, there's a point where there's gonna have to be some kind of protein, some kind of animal uh, need for them to feed on. So yeah, here we go, hundreds of them. So they get trapped inside, they put some pheromone, they go inside, they, they don't know how to come out. And then this is a good thing. You can capture the wasp, but there's always gonna be maggots and flies that are gonna be in there eating the wasp as well. So you can catch a bunch of insects if you find one of these traps, different things. Uh, more ants on uh, passion flower, more ants, uh, sorry, wasp pollinating. Uh, some of those fungus uh, wasp or uh, leaf cutter ants. Uh, and uh, this one happens to be one of the biggest ants uh, that I found. So ants are going to be underground. And once again, when it's time for their future queen and kings to be formed, uh, they're, they're going to be the ones with wings. And normally in the spring, when it's kind of cloudy, maybe a little bit of rain, you will see them coming out of the ground and congregating in large numbers. And then the ones that have wings will fly, mate, and then land and make a new home. So that's what's happening here in Brazil. Yes, uh, this is a future queen already made it, uh, and it's digging its burrow. Uh, and you can see some of the some of the bumps right there. But this is from South America. And so what happens is uh, this is uh, when it has the wings. And because they're gonna go underground, they don't know, no longer need the wings. They already made it, so they don't need to mate again. Uh, the first thing they do is they literally rip their wings from their back and they're never gonna fly again because you don't wanna have wings underground. It's gonna be a nuisance and that's more of a problem. So they rip them off and then they start digging and make a hole and that's gonna be the future home. Uh, and there's a powder wasp. So wasps have been making homes out of mud for way before people. Uh, so along the walls, uh, usually in the, uh, nice uh, cool areas, uh, you're going to see them. So they make their little apartments out of mud. You see them uh, in wet areas, picking up mud and then building their homes. They'll lay, uh, put some pollen in, uh, into these uh, uh, homes and then they lay in there. So they don't sting, they're vegetarian and they make their homes out of uh, mud. So powder wasp or mud wasp. I think that's it. So any question, anything else on this? Hold on, I have a video here. Where the heck can you show me? Today? So this is a wasp that is uh, probing a flower. So looking, probably trying to find a caterpillar underneath it. Are you gonna show me this? Come on. Are you gonna show me something else? I saw that, saw that, saw that. Saw that one. Oh, thank you. So I guess it's not recognizing open with. What about you? There's a very long 
egg laying up right. Oh yeah, look at that. Uh, I'm not talking because I'm recording. So you see the very long stinger and it bends, it flexes, there it is, almost as long as the body. So it's probing probably some caterpillars some insect in the flower and it's laying the neck uh, if it's able to catch it. Yes. So what happens if you want to play a really horrible trick on a caterpillar, uh, the antenna is able to read chemical signals. So what happens first, if there's a caterpillar and a wasp wants to know if it's the right one, it's going to go there and uh, use the antenna to kind of feel around it. So you take a little hair and kind of poke on top of the caterpillar, it'll think that it is a wasp checking it out and then they start jumping and then they go ballistic because they know that uh, if, a, if, a, if they found by a wasp, they're gonna get injected with an egg. Uh, so yeah, that's, a, that's one of the major roles of the antenna is to detect some of the chemical signals and determine uh, which is the right, uh, the right insect. I don't want to talk. I'm filming. You just hate that. Uh, and I think that's the last. I don't see any more videos. That's this one right here. So they showed me before. So that's a daisy that was here in Signal Hill. Oh, and then it showed me the powder wasp. What is this? So those are the powder wasps picking up the mud. Hold on. So then show me the swarm. Uh, so the swarm of uh, honeybees. So what happens when the colony needs to multiply? Future queens and queens are created. And when they mate, they'll come back and they'll uh, take several of their sisters with them and they fly out and they form a new colony, look for a new colony. When they swarm, uh, usually frightens people because there's a hundred bees flying around. There's hundred bees on the side of my wall, there's hundred bees on the branch of my trees. They're harmless because they don't have a home to protect. They're looking for a home. You can literally put your hand into the swarm and nothing's gonna happen. They're defending the queen that's in the center. The problem is when they find a crevice in your house and they're now established their colony, now they're gonna defend their home. Now they're gonna be a problem. But when they're out there in the middle of nowhere, lost looking for a place to live, they're gonna be harmless. So they stop and they rest. That's what happens. And that's when people see them and panic. And as they're resting, then they send out scouts to look for potential areas to make their home. And then they move there and they move around until they find that location. As long as it's necessary until they find a home. <laughs> Sometimes if the night catches them, they're just gonna stay there overnight and then move on the next day. So they're temporary. They're looking for a home. They don't wanna be there. Uh, they, they, they're, they're in the open, they're in danger. So they feel threatened. So this is uh, when they were just sleeping. Uh, honeybees, uh, flowers, the mud potter, uh, tiny bee here in uh, collecting pollen and nectar, uh, the honeybee. So this is the home for some of the uh, uh, native bees here. So these are known as uh, sand wasp because they, that's where they make their sand or their home in like decomposed granite or sand. They're a problem, they're a problem in uh, playing areas because they're sandy areas and they make their homes and people see them, oh, there's a wasp and it's gonna sting my child and oh my God, and now we have to kill them. Uh, harmless, they're just making their home and you can see them coming out. Uh, that's the rear end or at least maybe the side. So sand wasp. Uh, that's pepsis, so that's a tarantula hawk. And I forgot to mention that it is a, I heard that it's a very painful sting. Uh, if it stings you because it's big. And if you get it with a net, it'll pull you. So it has strong enough to pull you and, uh, and be very careful if you come across it. I respect them because I don't want to be stung by one of them. The, the theory is, that uh, wasps are so vicious 
that if they were to be the size of seagulls, they will be ruling this world because <laughs> they're, they're just that mean or that good at it. Uh, the face of a carpenter bee or a bumblebee, kind of cute, but see the antenna kind of elbow. Uh, some uh, bee and a banana. So that's the one we've seen, that's the one we've seen. Uh, this is another tarantula hawk or a spider wasp, just uh, scavenging the ground or looking for the wasp. So this is the velvet ant, okay? Huh? This is a wasp. You see the waistline? There is no bumps, but it has no wings. It crawls along the ground. And I heard that it is hurts when it stings you. Again, I have never been stung by him. Uh, but uh, it's called velvet, velvet ant because it has a lot of hairs. It's beautiful. Some of them are red. Uh, but it is a wingless wasp, and you don't want to mess with it. <laughs> so you see it, uh, take a picture, be very careful. That's why I said, uh, be careful with ones, uh, wasp, ins, bees, and ants, because they sting. Another tarantula or spider, uh, that's uh, an ant. See the bumps? And this one's carrying something, maybe some insect. Uh, there's big jaws taking care of this mealybug in the wild. Uh, pollinating or feeding on pollen nectar, paper wasp, and another wasp on flowers. So it's kind of nice. Uh, more leaf cutter. Uh, that's a moth, leaf cutter. Uh, and that's where we started. Uh, the waistline, remember? That very slender waistline, elbow, antennae. And that's what's really. All right. So, Let's make the, uh, any other questions? 